Hello everyone, this is Bob and Threadbear, and welcome back to Sleeping Dogs. We're on a special mission today, so I decided to get out a special vehicle. Mrs. Chu? Sammy, Sammy? Dog eyes. Dog eyes did it. Is that what Johnny told you? Winston. Well now, you can see I'm still in the outfit from the last video, but I think this calls for a change in costume. Hang on a second. I'm gonna be right back, I just need to go home and change. Done. Alright, now let's go find Dog Eyes. He's down at the docks right now. But I won't say anything else for the rest of this, for the sake of the ominous silence. That's right. It's my wedding outfit. Although, oddly enough, the pants and the shirt have turned white when they were black in the actual wedding outfit. Uh, told you to look at the colors. Kind of bugs me. Anyway, Sammy, what are you up to down here? Is that it? Okay. Hey man, stop messing Whoa, around. What the fuck, man? Let's work something out here, okay? Ew! They don't run like all that. Oh shit! <laughs> move, move! <laughs> yeah, he knows he's done something bad. Wow, you really have a death wish. <laughs> and man, I'm getting a lot of air here. Anything happens to me, big smiley is gonna send Tom to ask questions. You got it away? Huh? He won't send anyone. Not for you. Not so long as he keeps the territory, you know. By the way, do you notice the buffs I've got? They're all defensive. That's because I want this to last. Oh, he's not done running yet, huh? That's fine. Oh, I, I know exactly who I'm messing with. Hmm. Maybe one day. Oh, 
Ah, that's why you were coming here. Home base. Where all your friends are. That's good. Saves me the trouble. Jesus. He's got electric eels in that tank. <laughs> Ooh, fish. Fun. <laughs> oh, damn. His swing was faster than my fish. But not all of my swings. Ooh, he's got a knife. Good for you. <laughs> You've got a knife. Oh, now here's where they keep the good stuff. Hey, they dropped another fish. Alright, gonna use another fish. <laughs> ah, damn, that wasn't the right way to go. Well, so much for my menacing aura. <laughs> Whoops. What the fuck you want, man? You've done some bad things, Sammy. What did you call me? Huh? Nobody called me that anymore. This is about me balling your fucking sister, isn't it? Huh? You gotta be fucking kidding me, man! Wake up, little brother! It's not like I put that needle in her arm! You can't take this stuff personally, Way. It was business, you know what I'm saying? Not to me, it wasn't. Look! If you don't like it, you take it up with Big Smiley. He's the one who needs the pussy. I was doing my job. Oh, fuck, man. Is this what this is all about? Yeah. And Winston. And Peggy. Oh, fuck! You're coming with me. Look, maybe we can cut a deal. All right, stop all this shit, man. And I'll make sure that Big Smiley cuts you in on one of the side business. Maybe the fucking whole damn thing. I mean, hey. We could be generous, okay? Yeah, he's gonna be the future chairman of the fucking Solar on Yee! Yeah? You and Big Smile Lee are pretty close, huh? Yeah! We're tight, like motherfucking brothers! Me and Winston, we were tight too! Get him! Get him now! Man, he ran fast. Oh, yeah. Take your time. Got himself a cleaver, too. Oh, yeah, I forgot you can do that. There are grapple moves when you're armed, too. Give it up, you fuck. <laughs> so can I. By the way, I've heard that in Chinese culture, white is the color of death. Like, in... Western culture is the color of purity, so it was used for the wedding, since that was a Western-style wedding. But now... Oh, I knocked his hat off. Excellent. Now I think that Wei's suit is white for a different reason. Oh, damn it. My face ran out just in time. All right. Want me to punch him down? I'll do that. Man. Oh, I apparently I can't disarm him even in face mode because he's special. 
Because once you grapple him, you can do this. Listen, you're gonna regret this. Maybe. Wait, wait up! The car's over here. What's going on? We're bringing him to Mrs. Chu. She has something she wants to tell him. Mrs. Chu. All right. We can take care of this ourselves. You and me handle this, and it'll happen fast. This son of a bitch deserves the worst we can give him. You're the boss, man. And the worst is named Mrs. Chu. Yeah, figures. Oh, I shot the driver. What the? Having trouble climbing out at the moment. Nice. This is a pretty powerful assault rifle. That's why I'm actually blowing up these uh, cars and uh, motorcycles like reasonably often. Ooh, double tire shot. Those guys phased in from in front of those uh, exploding cars. <laughs> oh well. Whoops. Alright, yeah, they got more sense than to go down this alley. Oh jeez. Okay, that was not my fault. Well, except for that one guy you ran over. I don't think he'd agree. Oh, what? What the fuck you doing, huh? Wait, 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 wait! Sit down and shut the fuck up. Jesus, I haven't been here in fucking years. <laughs> Sammy,我為了你,一路開著個廚房,你睇,我漏埋啲骨喺裏面,你做咩啊嘛,係咪啊?It's <笑> 不是淨是你一個人,我朋友Johnny,老鼠仔,他都在這裡。What sure that wasn't business. A field report on broken nose Jing. Fuck. Yeah, that'll that'll give you nightmares. And PTSD. Which is not something Wei Shen needs more of. Anyway, let's look at that report. Broken Nose Jang. Let's see. Ah. Yep, she is the, um, the alternative to, um, Big Smile Lee. 
She wants to move away from drugs and prostitution and probably go into cybercrime, honestly. Credit card fraud. Online phishing. Honestly, she's she's kind of right when she says she they can get more money from that. Pirating, yeah. Might as well. Yeah, they want me to meet at the hospital, so I decided to uh, dress up in my doctor outfit that I got from that case I solved. And, uh, yeah. Something nice and white and big. Like a doctor would drive. Oh, oh, this is the initiation mission. I got the wrong outfit for this one. I, I was expecting something else. Tradition calls for us to select a temporary chairman. Until you are well, Uncle. A man who would continue as you would wish. If they were brazen enough to attack a wedding, we have to assume 18K will be coming after us. I know that you are right. Way, my boy. Uncle, you're okay. Thanks to you. Sister Chang told me about the troubles between you and Big Smile Lee here. You must stop this fight at once. We must be united against our true enemies. Yes, of course, Uncle Po. Good. Pakmak, see to it that Wei is formally initiated. He's been a loyal foot soldier to the Sun Han Ji. It's time to make him a red paw. Your initiation is Young Leong. He has been selling to schoolgirls and was ordered to stop. He switched to the 18K instead. Make an example of him. Thank you. I will. If any of your people have not been properly initiated, bring them with you. Uncle, we still need to decide who will lead us. What about you, Pakmak? You are my greatest friend. You know my wishes better than anyone. Would you not take my place? No, Uncle. I, I am your advisor. I cannot lead in your place. So, if not you... Who then? <clears throat> Chu Jin Sao. He is your true nephew, your blood, Legacy Doyan. Who better to preserve your wishes and keep the family together? Hmm. Chu Jin, can you handle this responsibility? Temporary chairman? Yes, Uncle. I am ready and grateful for the opportunity. Park Mark, see that it is done. Jackie, it's Wei. Where are you? Getting a massage, man. Let me tell you, the girls here are... Listen, I got some news. <laughs> I'm on my way over. We got an errand to run. See you in a few minutes. All right. But yeah, I, I should have worn one of my cop outfits for this. Would have been much more appropriate. But instead, I'm dressed up as a doctor. So, for the mission that I would have dressed up for a doctor as a doctor for, I'll wear a cop outfit for that too. It'll still be inappropriate, you know? Might as well. <laughs> Might come in handy too. This outfit doesn't have any bonuses, but most of the police ones do. Oh, he's in downtown. Massage sauna. Apparently, they do all kinds of massages here. <laughs> Jackie, you're gonna love this. What's going on, Wei? Well, you're about to become a full member of the Sun On Yi. Fuck me! Are you sure? 100%. Yeah, baby! <laughs> Fucking did it! Yeah! Oh, don't worry about it, my man. It'll be your turn soon. Jackie, they're making me a red pole. What? Holy shit, Wei! Well, Jackie, 
The dream finally comes true. No shit. Hey, wait. Don't think I don't appreciate it. I know it wouldn't have been possible without you. No problem, Jackie. Man, you want to get a massage before we go? My treat. Come on, man. Best way to celebrate. You won't believe what these girls can do. Well, it's not like way is monogamous, so... Yeah, massage sauna. Where's the sauna? Is it in the back? So what's this errand? It's part of our initiation. You know this guy? Holy shit! Young is one of us, Way. Came up in all prosperity just like you and me. Well, he's been dealing a kid. They ordered him to stop a couple of times. Okay. So so now we gotta deal with him. Tell you much about the ceremony? Just that we're in it. Brothers after that. Man, son on ye, brothers. Yeah. What? I went out with you made the other day. Finally asked her out, huh? Gotta go. Man, I made her laugh so hard. I read that somewhere. Did it make a girl laugh? She'll fall in love with you. I think if you're funny, she'll fall for you. Same thing, isn't it? Uh, depends on why she's laughing. Alright, time for this little uh, area here to actually have something happen in it. Hey, where's Young? Man, doctor walks into the room, everybody gets the hell out. Hey, he, he didn't even say anything. Kind of weird, honestly. Whoops. Didn't mean to run, ram him into the chair there. I was actually aiming for one of these AC vents. Alright, I'm in face mode, so I can do this to him. Come on. Finally. Oh, this guy knows how to kip up. Oh. That's the guy we're after. So I should get these other guys first. Maybe do something about, uh... About this here. There we go. Here we go. We need to talk to you. Uncle Poe sent us. Oh, he's still getting back up. Man, you're selling drugs to kids. You're doing something. He's not going down easy. Still? Or, oh, okay. Maybe pick up the the weapon. You okay? I don't know, man. I've never shit. Wait, I've never done that before. I know, I know. What was it? I don't know. My my hands are shaking, man. Look, take a breath, Jack. Breathe, man. Did you see the look in the guy's eyes? I didn't expect it to be like that. I was I was thought about how to look. I didn't know how it make me feel. You know? I can feel it in my stomach. Shit, way. Calm down. Look, it'll wear off. Okay? It's interesting that they've put these two missions together like this. 
Like, first we see how Wei doesn't treat humans as human anymore, and just is ready to just slaughter them all, and th then we cut to Jackie, who's you know, still has his humanity, still realizes that killing is wrong, and uh, we have him react to just killing one person, normally. And yeah, I, I kind of missed the exit here. It's because it was behind the road construction for some reason. Is it done? It's done. Good, good. Brothers, from today forward, your lives will be forever changed. Because today you are my brothers. We're bound to each other by blood, sworn to protect each other to the death if necessary. With our brotherhood comes duty. You will obey our leader in all things, and you will show your brothers respect always. With our brotherhood comes power. The sun on ye does not die. The sun on ye does not forget. It rewards its sons with wealth, status, and honor. It protects their businesses and their families. It cares for their children as if they were their own. Our brotherhood pays our enemies with pain suffering and death and none suffers more than a traitor betray your brothers and you will die a thousand times over slowly in the dark the sun on ye and the gods themselves will burn your soul from your body and crush the ashes with our heels there are 32 oaths with them you are bound together with them you become sun on ye are you ready to begin yeah, we're, we're not going to be hearing all 32 oaths. Kind of crazy how formalized it all gets when your crime organization has been around for centuries, though. Yeah, I don't know if it's actually been around that long, but... Well, you know, old world organized crime. Oh, it's time for a Raymond check-in. I read your report. I'm flattered. Was it a slow day or something? Pendra's very impressed. I'm not gonna lie, I'm sort of impressed too. He wants you to dig around, see what you can find on Sunny Woe, says it's a priority. I read about him. I mean, he reps entertainers, dabbles in porn with allegedly some human trafficking mixed in. Well, why go after him? He's not Sun On Yi. To bring down the Sun On Yi, we have to take down the people who support them, cut off the revenue sources, dismantle the network. This is how we hit him where it hurts. Sunny's revenue stream is massive, and a lot of it flows to Sun On Yi. I'll see what I can do, Raymond. By the way, you hear anything about Dog Eyes? He seems to have disappeared. Haven't heard a thing. Oh, and before I forget, Jackie Ma, we're taking him in. Jackie? From what I read in your reports, he'll be a good source of info, and it won't be hard to make him talk. We'll need you to set him up no, no, for no, us. No, that, that makes no sense. He's nobody. He's a criminal, Way. You're a cop. I hate to be a broken record, but it sounds like you're getting attached. I'm not getting attached. I'm just... I'm not a fucking idiot, okay? He's part of my cover. He brought me in. He's the one who vouched for me. And now you're so high up, you don't need him. He's outlived his usefulness, so we're bringing him in. I'm taking this up with Pendrew. This came from Pendrew. Taking him in accomplishes nothing, and it makes my job harder. I'm not doing it. You don't have a choice, all right? It's a direct order. Yeah? Direct order? Well, that's an order you can shove directly up your ass, Raymond. It's not about Jackie. They're testing his loyalty. We want the Red Bulls, the lieutenants like Winston. Open your eyes, Raymond. I am Winston now. That's what worries me, Way. You're one of them. Really shouldn't sleep with a stethoscope around your neck. Well, you could say that about most of his outfits. Jeans are really uncomfortable to sleep in. But yeah, new house. This one in Aberdeen. It's actually a house boat. So we're floating on the water right now. Easy now. Yeah, that's the big TV for the surveillance system. There's a punching bag, but sadly you can't interact with it except for doing this. And I showed you the kitchen with the uh, refrigerator, and that down there is uh, where you keep your clothes. All right. 
Oh yeah, I got something for Tuchin. Howard Tuchin Tsao. A red pole since 1981. Well, that's family connections for you. Otherwise unremarkable, though. Well, looks like Wei Shen just became a confirmed member of the Sun on Yi, so it's time to break out another milestone film. This time it's a, something a little unusual, although it's... <laughs> damn, it's actually the third Kung Fu parody movie I've covered. The film is called The Last Dragon. It's an American movie that came out in 1985. The story about the story. I've mentioned this before, but because of how the Cultural Revolution affected Hong Kong at the end of the 60s, kung fu movies in the 70s tended to favor underdog stories in which the heroes are nobody in particular, while the villains are wealthy, corrupt, and very often part of the establishment. Ghostface Killer from Mystery of Chess Boxing was a corrupt official before his downfall. The movie that Kung Pao Ender the Fist shredded up featured a villain who was a Japanese collaborator. In Miracle Fighters, the bad guy is the chief sorcerer for the Chinese Emperor. Legend of Drunken Master pits a folk hero against the exploitative British regime. These films were largely successful, despite being for the most part cheap and simple, because they resonated with the oppressed Chinese underclass in the British colony of Hong Kong. Because while the British might have been nicer colonial masters than other nations, that's kind of like saying having your teeth knocked out is better than having your arm torn off. You might be better off with one instead of the other, but there's still plenty of pain and lasting suffering coming your way. But then, guess who else happens to have a frequently marginalized and oppressed underclass? African Americans were, and still are, big fans of the martial arts genre, because the themes that helped sell the films in Hong Kong also resonate with them. A protagonist who comes from nowhere and uses his incredible inborn skills to bring justice and retribution to a world sorely lacking in both. He'll take on gangs, he'll take on authority figures, he'll take on anyone who abuses power. Thanks to his incredible skills and the help of his friends and allies, he will rise to victory. Of course, it also helped that most grindhouse cinemas were in urban neighborhoods, and most white folks had fled to the suburbs by this point, but still. The idea for The Last Dragon came from the writer, Louis Venosta. In 1984, he wanted to make a martial arts movie starring a black protagonist and the new studio TriStar Pictures agreed to take a risk on it, so long as he and the director Michael Schultz could shave down the budget to $10 million. They also convinced Motown Productions to make the movie, despite them having sworn off theatrical films after their disastrous adaptation of the Broadway musical The Wiz. Incidentally, this is also why the movie's female lead is a Motown singer, and why the soundtrack is amazing, even though the film isn't a musical. As for the male leads, the filmmakers made an interesting choice by bringing in a martial artist who couldn't act for the protagonist, and an actor who couldn't fight as the antagonist. Taimak, the martial artist, had to take lessons in acting while he was on set just before production began. As for the villain, Julius Carey worked with the film's three fight choreographers to get his moves down, and the actor performed many of his own stunts. Something else the production team did was actually film in New York City. It was more expensive than filming in Vancouver, but the director felt like only the real streets of Harlem would have the atmosphere that The Last Dragon needed. Not that everything is authentic, however because this movie is a parody, and one aspect of that parody is having Asian Americans act out black stereotypes, while the black characters used Asian stereotypes. But the best way for me to explain what I'm saying is to describe... The story. The movie begins with the protagonist, Leroy Green, nicknamed Bruce Leroy, training and cutting arrows in mid-flight. Taimok actually cut those arrows with his hand, by the way. The trick is that those arrows weren't the first to fly past. When he catches the third arrow and can't explain why, 
his master tears the training badge off his chest. But that's a good thing. His master has nothing more to teach him. They also talk about the glow, a mystical energy that will surround his body as proof of his ascension. Finally, when Leroy insists that he has more to learn, the master tells him to take a golden amulet owned by Bruce Lee himself to his next master, a sage named Sumdum Goy. Yeah, that's, that's seriously the name. The movie cuts to a noisy theater playing Enter the Dragon. The audience is having fun, but then a guy with an entourage and a fancy cape comes in and stops the movie. This is Shonuf, the Shogun of Harlem the baddest and the prettiest warrior in all New York City. Despite making a scene, he's just there to watch the movie, but then some kid shouts that Bruce Leroy could kick his ass. Leroy is in the audience, and apparently Shonuf is sick of hearing about him catching bullets with his teeth. But while Leroy's the peaceful type who doesn't fight without cause, the audience starts shit-talking Shonuf, and we get an extended fight scene of the Shogun kicking all their asses as Leroy leaps. Now we cut to some rich white guys in a gaudy apartment. The owner is Eddie Arcadian, a video arcade mogul, and with him are his girlfriend, Angela Veracho, his bodyguard Rock, a failed prize fighter, and whatever is in that green tank that eats pork legs. Oh, and they're watching Seventh Heaven, which is basically a copyright-free version of Soul Train, and it's hosted by Laura Charles, the character Vanity plays. The connection here is that Arcadian is pressuring her producer, JJ, played by a young William H. Macy, to play a music video starring Angela, but Laura gets the final word, and she is way too busy to care. That night, Leroy is still wandering the streets of New York, looking for some dumb goy, and he happens to spot Laura as she gets into her car after the show ends. They smile at each other, and maybe that would have been the end of things, but it turns out she's getting kidnapped by the man pretending to be her chauffeur. They stop right around the corner so more men can get in, but this gives Leroy the chance to catch up and beat them all up. They escape in the car, but Laura is safe and impressed. But Leroy leaves after making sure Laura's alright, leaving only the golden amulet he accidentally dropped next to Laura's feet. Leroy goes back to where the fight happened, looking for the amulet, but eventually he figures that Laura must have it. But the problem is that he doesn't know who Laura is. So instead, he goes to teach his martial arts class, a suspiciously familiar yellow and black jumpsuit. But the lesson is interrupted by Shonuf, who's back to challenge Leroy. But Leroy still won't rise to his bait, especially not in front of his students, though he also won't bow to the Shogun of Harlem. But then one of his less trained students meets the challenge and gets himself caught. So, to save the student's life, Leroy bows. The next morning, Leroy eats breakfast with his family, we find out that his dad owns a pizza place, and his early teens brother Richie has a precocious and overconfident crush on Laura. This advances the plot, by the way, because this lets Leroy find out about Seventh Heaven. Leroy insists on going with Richie to the next Seventh Heaven show, and Richie reluctantly lets him tag along, as he uses his backstage connections to get in without a ticket. But then Laura gets kidnapped successfully when she's lured into a truck by her own crew, and this time Leroy is a little too far off to help. He does, however, pick up a dropped binder with Eddie Arcadian's name on it. Now that Arcadian has captured Laura, he forces her to watch Angela's video, a pastiche of Madonna's early style. Laura, however, is not impressed, and she says so to Arcadian's face, despite being kidnapped, and despite the fact that Arcadian is basically a barely legitimate Bob boss. He's about to do something permanent to Laura, but then Leroy shows up in a damn ninja costume, throws knives at everybody with guns, and then beats everybody up. Eddie pulls his mask off, and in response, Leroy dunks his head in the tank with a thing in it. Uh, just for a moment, though. Just enough to scare him. This time, Leroy escorts Laura all the way back to her apartment. Leroy wants his medallion, but they're also clearly interested in each other. 
but Leroy leaves before much happens. The next day, Leroy is back to looking for some dumb goy. He finds a sign with that name on it on a fortune cookie factory. At the door, he gets hassled by some very black Chinese guys who really don't care about his quest for wisdom and stop him from getting in. Meanwhile, Shonuff goes to his family's pizza shop and starts breaking stuff as a message to Leroy. Leroy shows up, but only in time to see the gang leave. And this is finally enough to make Leroy angry. Still, he punches it out and meditates in a very symbolic red and white room. Then Laura shows up and asks Leroy to be her bodyguard, which is mostly just a pretext. It's kind of a bad time for Leroy, though, and he turns her down. Rock starts hiring killers to take out Leroy and Laura, a fact that disturbs Angela when Arcadian tells her about it. She actually has some very insightful things to say about how they're both using each other to get what they want, and then she storms out. For good. We then cut to Shonuff's gym. Arcadian and Rock have found out about him, and he will gladly fight Leroy for free, so long as they can make sure he shows up. Back with Leroy, he's feeling better, and goes to Laura's place to apologize. But he also says that he can't be her bodyguard until he finishes his mission to find a new master. Still, he gets in her car when she drives to the studio. On the way over, he admits that he has zero experience with romance and the opposite sex. Lucky for him, she finds it adorable. She then brings him to the dance floor to watch a music video that uses footage from Bruce Lee movies, something that combines both their interests. Richie sneaks in and sees them making out, which pisses him off to no end, and then Leroy gets inspired by the Chinese connection to try and sneak into the fortune cookie factory. Once he leaves, Richie returns to share some words with Laura, and so when Arcadian shows up and kidnaps Laura, yet again, they tie him up too. Leroy returns to the factory with one of his dad's pizzas, trying and failing to be as jive as the Chinese guys, but they think he's funny enough to let him hang out. He teaches them to play craps, like hopscotch, and when he shows them his medal, they take it and trick him into leaving. Finally, Leroy loses his patience and threatens them, so they take him to see some dumb goy. Turns out it's a machine that mixes and matches fortune cookie bullshit to create a constant stream of fortunes. Leroy immediately returns to his old master to ask him why he trolled him, so his master gives him an empty fortune cookie to reinforce his point. Leroy needs no master, because the only person who can teach Leroy what he needs to know now is Leroy. But he's got other things to worry about first. Angela stopped by Leroy's dojo to warn him about Seventh Heaven, so Leroy arms himself with ninja weapons and heads out. Leroy sneaks into the studio, but Arcadian spots him on the CCTV. He taunts him through the screens on the walls, and all the craziest and most colorful weirdos from earlier gang up on Leroy in a big brawl. A big John Goodman-looking dude fucking eats his nunchucks. But just then, Leroy's students show up, and they turn the fight into a great big melee. Even the junior division kicks some ass. Arcadian and Rock take Laura and retreat to a safer location, taunting Leroy into following them. They draw Leroy into an abandoned warehouse, where Shonuff is waiting for him. And so the final fight begins. Shonuff is a big guy, and he's got better range and power than Leroy. But Leroy is faster, and he knows how to sneak around. Leroy gets a powerful sneak attack on Shonuff that knocks him flat, and he thinks that's it. But that was just round one. Turns out Shonuff has the glow too, and apparently the glow is rotoscoped Tron lines over your fists. Shonuff's fists are red, natural. Shonuff straight up kicks Leroy's ass shouting over and over, Who is the master? And, thanks to some flashbacks, Leroy finally answers, Me. He starts glowing gold and blue, and unlike Shonuff, his glow covers his entire body. One final kick knocks Shonuff into a tub. When Leroy drags his head out of the water, 
Arcadian decides he's had enough and shoots Leroy. But do you remember how Shonuff said Leroy could catch a bullet with his teeth? He might have been exaggerating at the time, but it's true now. Leroy then disappears after leaving Arcadian for the police, but it's only so that he can show back up in Seventh Heaven for one last gag and a little romantic dancing. The End The Style Time Act doesn't really have a set style. Over the years, he's studied karate, Jeet Kune Do, Wing Chun, Hapkido, Jiu Jitsu, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, and Taekwondo. It's really a very American approach. So what I've decided to do with this segment is cover exactly that. American martial arts, the very eclectic medley of styles we have instead of the one national style or style family that other nations use. Back at the turn of the 20th century, most Americans had no idea that Eastern martial arts was even a thing. Like, at all. But that's not to say that martial arts as a field was unknown in the West. Boxing was so popular that by the 1900s, most states wound up banning prize fighting for being a blood sport that encouraged gambling. You also had wrestling, a martial art with roots all the way back to ancient Greece and Rome. And although the United States was never as in love with fencing as Europe was, it did have a strong stateside following. In the first decade of the 1900s, Chinese martial artists began to hold exhibition matches for American audiences. They were organized by Chinese rights advocates as a way to interest white Americans in Chinese culture. But seeing as this was arguably the most racist period in American history, they met with limited success. But it is interesting to look back and see how American journalists described kung fu matches with analogies to Western styles. To them, open palm strikes were fencing with your hands, and the goal of Chinese fighting was to avoid getting hit, whereas Western boxing was about hitting the most, a defense versus offense. And of course, the audience was quite amused to see Chinese boxers randomly switch to throwing each other like it was some sort of wrestling match. Of course, a red-blooded, white-skinned American heavyweight could pummel all these tiny boxing China men to paste, but the matches were amusing nonetheless. Still, when Asian martial arts took off in America, Chinese Americans had almost nothing to do with it. Oh, they were happy enough to show their skills to the white folk, but teaching them? <laughs> No way. Like I've said a few times before, martial arts were tied to national and cultural identities, so they weren't about to water down that association by teaching Kung Fu to Guaylos. No, the real turning point came in 1945, the year Japan surrendered to the United States. The U.S. occupied Japan for several years after that, and while the American troops and Japanese people didn't exactly get along, to put it mildly, there was opportunity for some cultural exchange to take place. It was only natural that the American soldiers would be interested in martial arts, and since the Japanese weren't really worried about protecting their cultural identity in their homeland, they taught the Americans karate. Within three years, American veterans would come back from Japan and start a national karate organization. Because of World War II, Karate was the first Eastern martial art to take off in America, and it continues to be the biggest Eastern style to this day. It's also why American women started learning Judo, a style that focuses on redirecting the opponent's weight and momentum, and thus works well for underweight fighters. If you ever wondered why female leads in 50s and 60s movies randomly knew Judo, the reason is World War II. Karate would remain the default American martial art for several decades to come, but then that started to change thanks to Bruce Lee in Hong Kong cinema. Now at first, Kung Fu's popularity was mostly limited to grindhouse theaters, but when Jackie Chan hit the American mainstream in the mid-90s, so did Kung Fu. That fueled America's Kung Fu fad in the aughts, and then you had other Eastern nations take advantage of the moment to popularize their own styles. Ong Bak and Muay Thai spring to mind, but the Thais weren't alone. And there were other forces at work outside of the movie industry. 
Japanese fighting games took over the arcades in the 80s and 90s, and their characters would use all sorts of crazy styles from around the world. MMA took off in the 90s and hit the mainstream in the aughts. So now America has become a melting pot of fighting styles, which I have to say is fairly appropriate. Now at this point I could say that no one style in the pod is supreme, not even any of the hybrid styles, but I went over all of that in the first video. So instead, thanks for joining me again for today's film review, and I hope I'll see you next time for a return to Thailand and a return to differently abled protagonists.